from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Ijoma Unyato. Hello and welcome. President Buhari's new Chief of Staff, Ibrahim Gambari, resumes office, pledges to give the government a global appeal. Federal Executive Council amends 2020 budget and medium-term expenditure framework, approves $25 per barrel as benchmark for crude oil. Kaduna State Government releases 60 al from isolation centers at Benue State, insists abolition of the system was a unanimous decision among northern governors. And United Nations warns more than 30 million people likely to fall into extreme poverty because of COVID-19 pandemic. Plus, we'll have business, sports, news from Abuja, the FCT, and later news from our studios in London. On business news, Nigeria LNG Limited signs engineering, procurement and construction con contract for Train 7 projects with its joint venture consortium. On sports news tonight, Syria put in motion plans to restart season on June 13th, pending approval of Italian government. And from Abuja, numbers of reported cases of human rights violation by security agencies drop significantly. National Human Rights Commission says all thanks to COVID-19 lockdown. President Mohamed Buhari today unveiled a new Chief of Staff, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, a career diplomat and former Minister of External Affairs who succeeds the late Abba Khiari. Ambassador Gambari was announced as the new Chief of Staff just before today's virtual Federal Executive Council meeting chaired by the President. At the meeting, the Council approved $25 per barrel of crude oil as benchmark, with production projection of 1.9 million barrels per day, amongst others. Our correspondent Ibrahim Adra reports. In the face of a ravaging pandemic, technology again comes to the rescue. The Federal Executive Council in a virtual meeting, a first in living memory and a fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. A few ministers joined President Buhari and Vice President Yemil Shiba during the council chambers, while others contributed from their offices. Ahead of deliberations, the Secretary to the Government of the Federation calls for silence in honor of former ministers who passed on, including the late Chief of Staff Malam Abakari. The Secretary to the Government then unveils the new Chief of Staff. Professor Gambari was part of the meeting which lasted two and a half hours. Well, I have not started, so I'll find out and let the, I, I don't report directly to the, to the nation, I report to the president. I think he demands loyalty, competence and support. The council approves the revised MTEF and 2020 budget estimates. The approval has these key parameters. The crude oil price is approved at $25 per barrel. Crude oil production is approved at 1.94 million barrels per day, and then an exchange rate of 360 Naira to one US dollar. Other approvals are for loans for agricultural mechanization and a facility for a Bongi state. It's going to be a major revolution in the agricultural sector that have, we have never seen before. Uh, and I think, uh, the executive council has done the right thing and has approved this. The Nigerian Port Authority is to purchase 19 operational vehicles at over 600 million naira, while the Minister of Power got approval for 47 billion naira augmentation to boost power grid infrastructure. 
The last meeting of the Federal Executive Council before this virtual engagement was in March 2020. Ibrahim Adra, reporting for Channels Television News. The new Chief of Staff has a long list of achievements to his name. He's an academic, an economist, and a distinguished diplomat. Now, between 1999 and 2012, Professor Gambari held various positions at the United Nations, from being President of UNICEF to becoming the UN Undersecretary General of the World Body. He also served as the first special advisor to the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. He also served as Nigeria's permanent representative of Nigeria to the United Nations between 1990 and 1999. Here at home, the new Chief of Staff was the Minister of External Affairs under President Muhammadu Buhari when he was Nigeria's military head of state. However, with all the laurels and accolades adorning the career of the new Chief of Staff, not everyone applauds his new appointment, including, unsurprisingly, a former Nigerian Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, whose critical comments about Professor Gambari's appointment are already trending on social media. So why did President Muhammadu Buhari appoint Professor Gambari as his new Chief of Staff? This is one of the questions we're trying to find answers to next, as we're joined in the studio by a former Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Professor Bola Akitarewa. I mean, so Prof, why do you think the President is appointing Professor Gambari as Chief of Staff? It's the second time, even though the first under this particular administration. Why at this time? We can look at many factors. Yeah. Factor one, we have always been told that the devil you know is quite better than an angel that you have never related with. So Mr. President knows him well. The second one related to this is acquaintance. As we have rightly pointed out, he was uh, formerly um, his foreign minister when uh, President Buhari uh, was head of state. But there are two other factors. You know, uh, Professor Ibrahim Gambari is at the epicenter of a quadrilateral wall of diplomacy. You have um, international affairs, which deals essentially with international questions, globalization, climate change, uh, crisis and conflicts, and so on and so forth. You also have international studies, which deal essentially with methodologies, analytical methodologies, you know. You study the international questions, international problems. You also have international relations, dealing with the relationship between states, interstates, as uh, Joe Bentham, uh, the English philosopher, coined the word international in the 17th century. That's the relationship. And the fourth world is the um, international law, which regulates the behavior of states. The four, you know, they are complementary. At the center, at the epicenter, is where I can say Professor Gambari is located. So if he turns left, he turns right, front, backward, he can at, at, at least see himself comfortably sitting down and understanding this. So for that one, he might have been seen that, look, in terms of professional expertise, he is certainly good for that. Then uh, the second uh, level of the analysis is to look at his uh, attitude. You pointed out about, um, you pointed out the position of uh, Ambassador Dakwafafura, another, you know, cerebral um, a diplomatist. I, I didn't say diplomat. I use diplomat in the sense of a Vienna Convention. People who are accredited and they are on the diplomatic list of the whole state. But for me, a diplomatist is someone who combines the state functions with a academic uh, disposition. Those people who are able to apply, you know, um, diplomatic conventions into empirical, um, you know, level of policy making. So, um, in this case, Ambassador Dapofafuora, for me, the way I understood his position, has not in any way uh, criticized, you know, um, Professor Gambari 
My understanding of it, if you look at what Dr. Fafura is essentially saying, he talked about um, his uh, quest for an academic to bring research input into policy making. That was why, for instance, he took much interest in uh, encouraging Professor Gambari to come to the UN as part of Nigeria's delegation. And in this particular case, he was there for about three months, he accommodated him. But what he's quarreling with is not in the person of uh, Ibrahim Gambari at all, from my own understanding. He complained about the fact that uh, Professor Gambari did report, did a secret report on him, uh, claiming that, look, um, he was not attending the meeting of the Islamic states in this case. Whereas, and that is where the problem is, many academics, including me, until I went to the foreign ministry to serve as a um, um, special assistant to two different foreign ministers. What we normally teach in the classrooms do not always reflect the situational reality on the diplomatic ground. Now, in this case, Professor Gambari went to the UN, the normal way any academic will go, in the belief that this is how it is done. You need to retrain yourself there. Professor Gambari went there and reported uh, Ambassador uh, Fafura that uh, he was not attending um, the meetings of the Islamic um, organization. And this led eventually to the unexpected retirement of a very bright, you know, of a very sagacious mind. Those who really are portraying Nigeria in, in, in good stead. So, and um, what happened, and that's very critical, and I, we need to underscore that, the issue was simply that Ambassador Fafora uh, was saying that, truly, Nigeria was not yet a member of the Islamic organization. Nigeria was not until that time even attending. So, uh, when um, I think um, the minister then understood the matter and didn't take the matter up. And the issue was that while Professor Gambari was underscoring the issue of an um, Islamic um, question, and we were not yet a member. So what uh, Ambassador Fafora is implicitly saying is that, look, Islamic fundamentalism on the one side, then Nigeria being considered as an Islamic state, we need to take a cautionary approach to it, which Professor Gambari as uh, um, chief of staff. That's what he's saying. In terms of um, his uh, attitudinal disposition to Professor Gambari, I do not think he has any qualms about that. Okay, Prof, just, just to ask now, looking at the antecedents of appointments in, in this administration, leadership style, we've heard about body language and all that, what sort of chief of staff do you think should complement the efforts of this particular administration? What should he be doing in terms of his priority? You see, that's a very critical but beautiful question. Any chief of staff who is to help President Muhammad Dubuari must open his or her mind clearly open to the truth that is on ground. Nigeria is currently confronted with two or three major problems. You have the allegation of a possible fulanization of Nigeria. You also have a second issue, possible Islamization of Nigeria. These are critical issues on the ground that they are talking about. And the third one is this issue of um, critical uh, misunderstanding between the Fulani men and the farmers. Now, any chief of staff who really wants to help Nigeria in general, and President Muhammad Buhari, he must draw his attention to it 
And being a diplomat, an international functionary for that matter, all right, he should be able now to bring his uh, experiential knowledge of the world to let Mr. President know quite well that Nigeria is on the path, you know, of disintegration. Gradually, they are killing Nigeria gradually as of today, and he will need to sit down and walk along that side rather than coming to sit down just like um, a secretary that will work on, on an organogram of uh, who should see Mr. President, who should not see Mr. President. He should play an active part as a diplomatist. Former Director General of the Nigerian Institute of International Affairs, Professor Bola Akiterua, thanks a lot for sharing your thoughts on the news at 10 tonight. Thank you, Prof. Thank you for having me. And in part two, after the break, is the 2020 budget amendment by the Federal Executive Council a decision in the right direction? The Chief Executive of Financial Derivatives Company, Bismarck Rewane, shares his thoughts next. That's in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10 on Channels Television, coming to you live from Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. President Buhari's new Chief of Staff, Ibrahim Gambari, resumes office, pledges to give the government a global appeal. Federal Executive Council amends 2020 budget and medium-term expenditure framework, approves $25 per barrel as benchmark for crude oil. Haruna State Government releases 60 al from isolation centers. As Benue State insists, abolition of the system was a unanimous decision among northern governors. And United Nations warns more than 30 million people likely to fall into extreme poverty because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our website, channelstv.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android, Fire and Roku TV as well. The revised medium expenditure framework is a step in the right direction, which reflects the current economic realities. And that's according to the chief executive officer of financial derivatives company, Mr. Bismarck Rewane. He told Channels Television today in an interview that the approved amendment is a consecutive but prudent approach, which would enable proper management of public finances. What has been approved today, uh, what was presented and approved, was a reality check uh, espoused by the Ministry of Finance and National Planning to deal with the reality of our situation. In other words, we reduced the expenditure marginally in terms of the budget because some other items were added for palliatives and other healthcare infrastructure uh, items. But what is more important was that the fiscal deficit, um, the revenues have been re reflect the reality of the oil markets, which is down to about 5 trillion naira. Um, the budget deficit is about 5.3 trillion naira, which is about 3.5% of GDP. I think this is a, a prudent move and also a move that reflects the austere times we live in. The price projection of $25 a barrel is even below today's spot price. But if you look at all the projections, the consensus of opinion is that in the year 2020, you are going to have an average oil price of about $35 a barrel. So there's a $10 headroom on $25 a barrel. And that, that is, uh, again, a conservative, but also a prudent approach to managing public finances. So on the one hand, you have a oil price which is below the spot price. Right now, the benchmark is below the spot price. And secondly, you have production which takes into consideration the OPEC quota and the condensate reality. But if you look, and don't forget that this is a three-year framework. And what is more important is that the budget of this year, which was submitted in December last year, has been fine-tuned at least twice. 
to bring it in term, bring it down to the reality which we face today. I think that itself is a very important point to, to understand. You must bear in mind that there's going to be new production, new investments. The, the petroleum bill, uh, petroleum invest, uh, PIGB has, been, has gone through various readings. Hopefully it gets us centered to, and that will also incentivize both the multinationals and the indigenous uh, investors in the oil sector. Because we, we have to continue to nurture the golden goose that lays the golden eggs. The Mambila Power Project and East West Road are not among the federal government's priority projects to be funded by the recently repatriated Sunny Abacha Lute. A statement from the President's Special Assistant on Media and Publicity, Mr. Garba Shehu, admits that the Mambila Power Project was mistakenly named as one of the five projects to benefit from the $311 million Abacha loot under the Presidential Infrastructure Development Fund. He acknowledged that although the Mambila and East-West Expressway are regarded under the PIDF as priority projects, they are exempt from the agreement signed between the Nigerian government, the United States and the Bailiwick of Jersey. According to the document, only the second Niger Bridge, Abuja Kaduna Kanu Expressway and the Lagos Ibano Expressway will benefit from the repatriated funds. A social media video has surfaced showing officials of the Kwara State COVID-19 team evacuating a patient into an ambulance without observing the necessary safety protocols. The officials are seen without personal protective equipment, wheeling the obviously sick man into an ambulance. Consequently, the state governor, Abdul Rahman Abdul Razak, has ordered the sack of a government driver that unilaterally attended to the patient who was evacuated with a COVID-19 ambulance in Ilori, the state capital. This is confirmed in a statement from the chief press secretary to the governor, Rafu Ajakaye. The governor has also directed that queries be issued to top officials of the state's Ministry of Health for failing to act with necessary caution and expertise in the handling of the incident that was recorded in a viral video. According to the statement, the governor condemns the shoddy handling of the gentleman who is clearly going through a very hard time. Let's cross over to Abuja now, and here's Ibrahim Adra. Ibrahim? Hi, Ijoma. Now, Kaduna State Government has released 60 more al Majere from isolation after they tested negative to the coronavirus. The Commissioner for Human Services and Social Development in the state, Hafsad Baba, explains that the children were quarantined for 14 days after being deported to Kaduna from other states and have been declared COVID-19 free by the State Minister of Health. She says the 60 al Majore have been reunited with their families. Meanwhile, contrary to different opinions expressed by the Kaduna and Katsina state governors against the repatriation of al Majore to their states of origin, the Benue state government insists it was a unanimous decision of the Northern Governors Forum. The Benue state deputy governor, Mr. Benson Abono, who explained this position today, said the forum took the decision to abolish the al Majore system at a meeting and the period of the COVID-19 lockdown provides the opportunity to do so without hindrance. Mr. Abono offered this clarification today while repatriating 12 al Majore from Kanu and Jigao states who tested negative to the virus eight days after they were taken into isolation. Kaduna State obviously could not have been one of those that are kicking against the, the transfer of uh, al Majores to their home states and, and, and eventually to their families. Because Governor Erufai is in the forefront of the advocacy for the abolition of al Majore system in northern Nigeria. Uh, and so it is with Kano. As a matter of fact, Kano State was a pioneer state in sending away al Majores to their respective families. And it was a deliberate policy that was agreed upon by members of the Northern Governors Forum that the al Majores system has been something that has not been of any use to the development of the youth in Northern Nigeria. And as a result, it was unanimously agreed in the Northern Governors Forum meeting that the al Majori system be abolished and that there is no better time than now 
to do this because uh, people are asked to remain at home and stay with their families. And in the federal capital territory, the National Human Rights Commission says the numbers of reported cases of human rights violation by security agencies dropped significantly during the last three weeks of the presidential lockdown. According to the executive secretary of the commission, reported cases of extrajudicial killings by security officials reduced from 18 in the first two weeks of lockdown to 11. Mr. Tony Ojuku, who was speaking at a news conference in Abuja, however, notes that violation of the rights of COVID-19 patients, as well as health care workers in some treatment centers, is a cause for concern. We appreciate the work the security agencies are doing. The work they are doing is very, very important. But the question is, are we going to say because they are doing a very important work, Therefore, they should violate the human rights of everybody. We believe they can still do their work if you feel somebody has violated the lockdown. We don't need to from uh, the person or start using a whip on the person or tell the person to go inside the gutter. There is a mobile court. You take the person to the mobile court. The mobile court will try the person and sentence the person. If somebody has violated the lockdown, do you need to use a gun and shoot him to death? So we, we, are, we are happy about the condemnation of this kind of high-handedness and impunity which was initially exhibited by the law enforcement agents. But you can see that the respect for human rights has improved in the second part of the lockdown. First of all, the number of complaints we received within the first two weeks outnumbered the number of complaints we received within the subsequent three weeks. In the first two weeks, we had about 18 deaths, 18 extrajudicial killings. In the other three weeks, we only had 11. We have more updates on COVID-19 when the news at 10 returns. Plus, Nigeria LNG signs engineering procurement and construction contracts for 27 project with its joint venture consortium. That's on Business News. Stay with us. You're watching the news at 10. 13 patients, including six health workers in Bochester, have recovered from COVID-19 and have been discharged from the isolation centers. The state's commissioner for health, Dr. Ali Umegoro, who confirmed this to Channels Television, says the number of deaths recorded in the state has increased to three. He explains that there are no severe cases being managed so far and over 1,500 people have been tested for the virus in the state. And compliance of transporters to guidelines following the ease of the lockdown in the nation's capital has been partial. Uh, while some drivers take it seriously, others still carry passengers not wearing face masks and total disregard for social distancing. That's what our correspondent Kela Megua found out. Interstate motor parks remain shut following the ban on interstate travel. Despite this, Two trucks that carried fertilizer bags from Edo State to Kano and Kaduna were apprehended by the FCT Ministerial Joint Enforcement Task Team on COVID-19 because hiding in those trucks on the return trip to Edo State were 68 people. No, but Akaba, man, you're not supposed to be carrying people up and down. Let everybody remain where they are for treatment. They've been arraigned, fined, and sent back to their state of origin. Inside the city, transporters are aware of the rules for loading cars during this pandemic. One for, one for front, two for center, two for back. However, there's not much compliance here at the AYA axis. You're not supposed to carry three for back, Nadi. So why do they carry three for back? Over at the Bega Junction in Wuse, the passengers are comfortable with the level of social distancing being observed. Well, they are carrying two to no more standing and the rest of it, so the social distancing is, is active. 
The transporters say the best they can do is stop people from standing in the buses. For that uh, 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 distance where they talk, they carry to no standing. That's to carry normal, normal passenger, so that nobody will be inconvenienced. The walking days, the upper mass will carry 21 instead of 50. Then the coastal bus, instead of 36 passengers, the coastal bus is carrying 18 passengers. It would be wrong to say no changes have been made by transporters in the nation's capital. However, much more needs to be done to keep people safe during this eased lockdown. Correspondent Kela Megua there. That's all from this end. Let's rejoin Ijoma in our Lagos studio. Thanks a lot, Ibrahim. In the southeast, the Enugu state government has announced the 11th COVID-19 case in the state. A 40-year-old man who had been in Kano since April and returned to Enugu on May the 4th. According to Governor Ifan Yogwani, all the confirmed cases were imported travelers who have clearly violated the ban on interstate travel issued by the federal and state government. He called on those manning the state's borders to take their jobs more seriously to save lives at this critical period. On the 11th of May 2020, Enugu State had its 11th confirmed positive case. A 40-year-old male who had been in Kano since April 2020 and came back to Enugu on the 4th of May 2020. In the Enugu, it is obvious from the above records that all confirmed positive cases in Enugu are imported by people who, despite the presidential order on restriction of interstate movement and the substantive order of the state government banning interstate movement, enter the state illegally. It, is, it has become imperative that we all take responsibility to protect our dear state from this illegal influx of people into the state. To this end, all those charged with responsibility to protect our land borders are encouraged to put more efforts to ensure that our borders are properly secured to curb this unfortunate importation of the COVID-19 into the state. And back here in Lagos, the state government today discharged 26 COVID-19 patients after receiving treatment. Governor Babajide Sonwolu confirmed this in a statement, and he said the patients, 13 male and 13 female, were discharged from Yaba, Onikon, and Lagos University Teaching Hospital isolation facilities. He says six patients from the mainland infectious disease hospital, Yaba, 11 from Onikon, and 9 from the Luth Isolation Center were discharged, having fully recovered and tested negative to COVID-19 twice. This now brings the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases that have been successfully managed and discharged in Lagos to 528. Record bankers and makers of JIC, in partnership with the Lagos state government, say they're proud to collaborate with the state government in the fight against COVID-19. The organization's West Africa country manager, Mr. Asif Hashimi, said this in a statement as the company intensifies its ongoing decontamination of public places in Lagos. According to Mr. Hashimi, the initiative is the company's contribution towards curbing the spread of infectious diseases. Combat ready against COVID-19 with a concentrate diluted in huge tankers to fiercely fight the virus. These are men specially selected by the Lagos state government in partnership with Rakit Benkiza, makers of JIC in Nigeria. Their task, to wage war on the pandemic. The Lagos state government announced a compulsory use of face masks and other measures, but that perhaps isn't enough. Private sector involvement has become crucial in this quest. We need to fumigate, disinfect, and decontaminate. So we have a very good environmentally friendly decontaminator. It's called sodium hypochlorite. We file out on a convoy of four huge sized tankers, all containing the mixture provided by Rekit Benkiza. As part of its ongoing disinfectant exercise in Lagos, the management earlier issued a release in which its Hygiene West Africa country manager, Mr. Asif Hashimi, said, 
over the years, Nigeria have come to trust Jeek to keep their homes in good sanitary state and help curb the spread of infectious diseases in their families. Jeek is safe for the environment as it kills 99.9% of illness-causing germs on surfaces, laundry and in the environment. And this has been corroborated by the National Centre for Disease Control, NCDC, as part of precautions that should be adopted to help with prevention, amongst other measures. While efforts of the government in partnership with private organisations such as this are compelling. A declusterization of gatherings like this, by staying at home, may help win the battle against the pandemic with Jeek as a reliable weapon. Let's take a look at some business news now. Here's Kayode Okikiolu. Thank you, Jomar, and you're welcome to Business News. The Nigeria LNG has signed the engineering, procurement and construction contract for Train 7 with a joint venture consortium comprising Saipem, Chiyoda and Daewoo as it plans a major gas expansion in the country. The long-awaited project is expected to increase the capacity of NLNG's current six-train plant by 35% to 30 million tonnes per annum. Speaking during the signing of the contract today via webinar, the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of NLNG, Engineer Tony Atta, says the project upon completion will support the federal government's drive to generate more revenue from Nigeria's proven gas reserves of about 200 trillion cubic feet. The construction period is expected to last nearly five years, with the first LNG rundown expected in 2025. And Nigeria's foreign reserves have risen to $34.65 billion within 11 days, and that's according to latest figures from the central bank. The report indicates that the reserves rose by $1.22 billion to $34.65 billion as at May the 11th, and that's up from $33.42 billion recorded as at April the 29th this year. The reserves had slipped into a decline after hitting a high of $45.17 billion on June the 11th last year, losing about $11 billion to stand at $33.89 billion as of April the 28th, 2020. Now, some company news. Airtel Africa has released its full-year financial statement for 2020, showing a satisfactory performance within the period. According to its results sent to the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the telecoms giant's revenue increased by 11.2% to $3.42 billion for the year ended March the 31st, 2020. Similarly, the telco's operating profit climbed by 22.8%, pre-tax profit jumped by 71.8% to $598 million, but its net profit fell by 4.2% to $408 million within the period. Meanwhile, Airtel Africa's Nigeria and East Africa subsidiaries continued to deliver strong performances, which were largely driven by the growth in its customer base. Let's check in with the NSE. After some fluctuations in today's trading session, the domestic stock market ended the day mildly negative, and that's due to sustained but moderate profit taken by investors. Temple Ashaju has the details. Thank you so much for joining us on the Stock Market Report. For the fourth consecutive trading session, equities markets, which had been the toast of local investors lately, ended negatively as the key benchmark index slipped by 0.03% after some last-minute profits taken on telco giant MTN Nigeria. Now, FBN holdings remained the boost for the activity level, which saw total volume settling at about 160 million units for an estimated value of 1.5 billion naira in 3,000 573 deals. And with the influence of 11 PLC, oil and gas capped gains by 2.66%, leading all other segments which also closed in green. The market breadth moved, of course, positively today with some 20 gainers against seven laggards as May and Baker, which announces a total dividend payout of 431 million naira today, comes behind Unilever and 11 PLC. Jai's Bank drags the most by the same margin with Union Diagnostic Clinical Services for the session. And that's your Stock Market Report. I'm Temple Ashaju.
And that's business news for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I am Kayode Okikulu. The news at 10 continues with Ijeoma. Thanks, Kayode. Still ahead on the news at 10, United Nations warns more than 30 million people likely to fall into extreme poverty because of the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll have this and more from our London studios in Around the World in 5. Just stay with us. Welcome back. The United Nations says more than 30 million people are likely to fall into extreme poverty this year, mainly in Africa, as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. The world body also expects rich economies to shrink more than 5%. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news in Around the World in 5. Welcome to the Channel Studios here in London for your international news around the world in 5. Europe's reopening has gathered pace after weeks of coronavirus lockdown despite a global death toll that's closing in on 300,000 people. Austria has announced its border with Germany would reopen after a two-month shutdown, while many European countries such as the UK and France have begun to ease restrictions. Brazil has recorded its highest daily rise in the number of deaths from the virus, and that's according to health officials. Here, nurses in Sao Paulo held a vigil for their fallen colleagues, using International Nurses Day to raise awareness and demand action on the high number of medics that are dying on coronavirus front lines. Brazil registered 881 new deaths on Tuesday. The total death toll now stands at 12,400 people, meaning the country is now the sixth worst affected country in terms of recorded deaths. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has arrived in Israel for talks on its plans to annex parts of the occupied West Bank as a Palestinian was killed in the territory by Israeli fire. <laughs> Palestinians held a funeral procession for the teenager killed in a refugee camp near the city of Hebron. The Palestinian Health Ministry has said that the teenager was killed during a raid, while the Israeli military has said that the soldiers responded with live fire after Palestinians threw rocks and fire grenades at them. Lesotho's Prime Minister Thomas Tabane has said that he will resign two years before his elected term is due to end after a months-long political crisis dominated by his private life. The Prime Minister has been under pressure to resign over a case in which he and his current wife are suspected to conspire to murder his former wife nearly three years ago. They both deny any involvement. Tabane has said he is retiring because of his age. Meanwhile, in Sudan, health officials have for the first time confirmed cases of the virus in camps for people displaced by conflict. Yes. Years of conflict have left South Sudan with one of the least equipped healthcare systems on the African continent. Two people have become infected in a camp in the capital Juba and one in the north of the country. Health experts have been warning of the potential danger if the virus were to spread in the overgrounded camps, which are home to close to 200,000 people across the country. The United Nations has distributed food packages to refugees and migrants in the Libyan capital of Tripoli. Now it's becoming worse because of the coronavirus. Libya has an estimated 654,000 refugees and migrants, many who lived in cramped conditions with little access to health care. So far, there have been no reports of coronavirus among migrants in Libya, but many have warned of the devastating impact that the virus could have if it were to spread there. In Peru, police have arrested more than 20 clowns and street performers for ignoring coronavirus lockdown restrictions. <laughs> Peru extended its lockdown to stop the spread of the virus last week as it struggles to flatten the curve of new infections. There have been over 68,000 confirmed cases and nearly 2,000 deaths in Peru due to COVID-19. And finally, a Mexican graffiti artist has painted a series of murals in Mexico City to pay tribute to the work of doctors, nurses and other health workers who are battling the virus. The graffiti artist known as Cato said he began the project after learning that many health workers in Mexico and across Latin America have faced aggression and stigmatization from people who fear infection from carers. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel studio in Lagos. Thanks a lot, Simon. To sports now, here's Olumide Makoli. Thank you, Ijama. Hello and welcome to Sports News. Switzerland government have announced a $362 million rescue package for its professional football and ice hockey leagues, but 
insists the money should not be used to pay wages to high-earning players. The Swiss Football League is yet to decide whether it will attempt to complete the season after it was interrupted by the coronavirus pandemic at the start of March, though the ice hockey season has already been abandoned. The government said the money will be paid in form of loans and that federal loans must not be used to finance players above average salaries. The government said a further $154.78 million was made available to other sports. Multiple Olympic champion Mo Farah says the postponement of the Tokyo Games to 2021 could work to his advantage as the Briton will now have around 20 months to train for the defense of his 10,000-meter title, having switched his focus back to the track. The 37-year-old retired from track athletics in 2017 to focus on road marathons, but announced in November last year that he was returning for one more tilt at the 10,000-meter gold. Farah, who must still qualify, will be 38 by the time of the Games in July and August next year, but is looking on the bright side. Italian Serie A have announced a provisional date to resume the 2019-2020 season from June the 13th, following requested chances, changes to the medical protocol, which have continued to cause controversy amongst the clubs. A go-ahead has been given to resume group training from Monday, May the 18th. However, the league governing body stated that if one player or member of staff tests positive for COVID-19 after the group training begins on Monday, the entire squad will have to go into quarantine for 15 days. And that's sports news. It's back to you, Gemma, for the close of the news at 10. Thanks a lot, Olumide. Nigerian army authorities say troops of Sector 1 Operation Lafia Dole have successfully repelled an attack by Boko Haram terrorists at the Minok Jakana Axis in Kaga local government area of Borono State. According to a statement from the army spokesman, Colonel Sagir Musa, nine Boko Haram terrorists were killed, while two gun trucks mounted with anti-aircraft guns have been captured. Their attempts to invade a military base in the village were met with stiff resistance by the troops on the ground who engaged the insurgents in a gun battle. And the main news again. President Muhammadu Buhari's new chief of staff, Professor Ibrahim Gambari, today assumed office. He pledged to give the government a global appeal. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thanks so much for staying with us. I'm Ijoma Onyato. Please stay safe. Thank you.